The only nations known to have treaties in North Carolina were the British government and subsequently the U.S. government, where the Cherokee in the mountains and the Tuscarora or the Piedmont and the coastal country. I'm sorry. These treaties and agreement, agreements made with them were to live on in perpetuity, and they always involved, to some extent, landmines. This one issue is to most Tuscarora today the real reason for the 120 plus year battle for recognition and being forced and or coerced to accept a long list of fictitious names. The last treaty signed between the Tuscarora within North Carolina and the United States was the Treaty of 1802 in which the remaining lands of the Bertie County Reservation were to be sold and or leased. These leases were to expire in 1916 and if there were no recognized Tuscarora still in the state, these lands would revert to North Carolina forever. This treaty was never ratified and signed by the then President Thomas Jefferson. So this tr treaty is, in essence, null and void. Still, North Carolina, with the assistance of the federal government, has acted as though it was valid and has gone to great lengths to ensure that a Tuscarora nation is never reestablished again within the state. North Carolina has been successful thus far in stopping the reestablishment of a Tuscarora nation, and they have accomplished this by beginning the practice of historical revisionism and what many of us today deem as cultural genocide. <coughs> this began on February 10, 1885 with the passage of the Croatan Recognition Bill by the North Carolina Legislature. The beginning of this legislation stated in part, whereas the Indians now living in Robinson County claim to be the descendants of a friendly tribe who once resided in eastern North Carolina on the Roanoke River, known as Croatan Indians. Just like Mr. Hurt just stated, the only tribe ever known to be the quote-unquote friendly tribe was a tribe of Tuscarora that were given that, that reservation. The main proponent and sponsor of the legislation, Hamilton McMillan, who is considered the father of what is now known as UNCP, was quoted two days later on February 12, 1885 in the Fayetteville Observer, talking about our people here and our rightful identification. In part, it read, they say that their traditions say that the people we call the Croatan Indians, though they do not recognize that name as that of a tribe, but only a village and that they were Tuscaroras, were always friendly to the whites, and finding them destitute and despairing of ever receiving aid from England, persuaded them to leave the island and go to the mainland. They gradually drifted away from their original seats and at length settled in Robinson, about the center of the county. In 1888, our people petitioned as Croatan for education benefits from the federal government, but by 1890 were turned down because of various reasons. The name Croatan would remain our designation until the year 1911, when the name was changed to Indians of Robinson County. Only two years later, we were redesignated Cherokees of Robinson County. Over the next few decades, several more federal recognition attempts were made with the same denials, usually with the government stating that a lack of treaty obligation <coughs> relieved them of any responsibilities to our people. Yes, that statement is true, but it's because we had been redesignated already by, by that time three times. If we had been designated as Tuscarora, then these statements that they used for over a nine-year period would not have been the case. They could not have used that as an excuse. In 1914, the U.S. Senate directed the Secretary of the Interior to cause an investigation to be made on the condition and tribal rights of the Indians of Robinson County. And in a report to Congress what tribal rights, if any, they have with any band or tribe, whether they are entitled to or have received any lands, or whether there are any monies due them. Within this very lengthy document, now commonly known as the McPherson Report, no connection to Tuscarora was ever made, other than using revised history produced by Hamilton McMillan and Angus McLean, two politicians who 
led our people to believe that we were actually ancient enemies of the Tuscarora, which many of our people today still believe to be true. During the same time frame, the Tuscarora Nation of New York began an attempt to reclaim land within North Carolina. These lands were the Bertie County Reservation lands whose leases were to be, to be expired in 1916. And the Tuscarora Nation of New York would continue their claims about these lands for the next half century until the early 1970s. This will be discussed again later in the presentation. It was not until the passage of the Reorganization Act of 1934 that our people finally had a real chance of federal recognition. This act, which allowed non-reservation Indians to reorganize, reinvigorated our people's hopes, but these hopes, too, began to fade. By this time, there were several factions here. One clung to the Cherokee name, and another chose the newest theory, Sumon. This newest theory, like its predecessors, were initially made by non-native historians or politicians who based their assertions on feelings and or intentional lies and not facts. The Suons of Robinson County in 1935 asked to be included in the newly passed IRA Act, and the government subsequently began to send individuals here for the purpose of investigation and tests to determine what could be done and who would benefit from the act. The government brought over 9,000 acres of land to be used, in essence, as a newly created reservation for those who would eventually be accepted as the required half or more full blood. The testing took place in only one area of the county. This occurred at what is known as the Brook Settlement, which is only a few miles west of Pembroke today. Only, only 209 out of the over 12,000 Indians of Robinson County at that time were tested, with most not even knowing about what was going on. Out of the 209 that were tested, the government eventually accepted only 22. These were three that were not accepted. But they soon found out again that the promises made by the government are so kept, and the rights they had as half or more full bullets under the IRA were not going to be honored. The government began selling the lands bought only a few years prior and completely backed away from allowing the 22 individuals from organizing as a recognized tribe. The government realized that it's recognizing a tribe would open the door for all Indians here, as well as potentially reestablishing treaty rights as the Tuscarora Nation, should the people decide on a change of name years later. The government again used the lack of treaty obligations as a final reason for not allowing even the recognized 22 to reestablish the tribe in 1945. With, with a letter from the Assistant Commissioner of Indian Affairs, William Zimmerman. In part, it read, the reason why the Indian Service does not concern itself with these Indians is that the federal government has no treaty obligations to them. The next blow to our people, or at least that some of, our, some of us feel was a, a major blow to our people, was the passage of the Lumbee Act of 1953 within the state and subsequently in the Lumbee Act of 1956 on the federal level, which once again renamed our people. This time the name was Lumbee, which we feel has ultimately acted as an albatross to all Indians of Robinson County, since the name was basically for forced upon our people, with less than 10% of our people taking part in the name referendum. In 1955, prior to the passage of the Lumbee Act, government representatives again used the lack of treaty obligations as the ultimate reason to refuse full recognition. One letter from the Assistant Secretary of the Interior stated in part, the United States has entered into no treaty agreement with the Indians of Robinson and joining counties, and it has recognized no obligation to furnish them services that are furnished to the citizens of this country who are recognized by Congress as Indians. Since 1956, since 1956, the government has continually viewed the Lumbee Act as a termination act, thereby using it today as a reason for denying full recognition for anyone living in Robinson County. 
For the next 15 years, things were pretty quiet, and it was not until about 1970 that recognition efforts began again. <clears throat> this time, though, many of our people who never accepted the Olympian name began to reorganize themselves as Tuscarora specifically. Now that our people began using Tuscarora specifically, the government could no longer use the no treaty obligations excuse that they had used against our people for the previous nine years. Also during the same time frame, the Indian Claims Commission suddenly changes their stance regarding the Tuscarora in New York, now saying that they were the correct party to bring suit in regards to the Virgin Lands and reconfirming that the 1802 treaty was never signed by the President. Please note that this took place only after the Tuscarora movement reemerged within North Carolina. By this time, the eight surviving individuals that were recognized in the 1930s helped to reorganize the Tuscarora movement and once again approached the BIA with a request for a reservation and recognition of Tuscarora. This request perplexed the BIA partly because those now working within the BIA knew nothing of the 22 receiving recognition 40 years prior. And they didn't know what to say because of the language of the Lumbian Act and how it might affect these individuals. When the government finally answered their request, they began to use the Lumbian Act language as a convenient excuse, unilaterally stripping the 22 of the rights given them decades before. As a result, Tuscarora leaders approached the Native American Rights Fund, asking for their assistance in fighting this new ruling by the BIA. A federal lawsuit was filed in 1973, and within a few months, the presiding judge ruled in favor of the defendants in the United States. An appeal was quickly filed, this time with only one plaintiff, Lawrence Manning, one of the original 22. In 1975, this suit was finally won by Mr. Manning. This suit, commonly referred to today as Manor versus Morton, should have paved the way for final recognition of both Tuscarora and those who accepted the name Lumbee. But again, that would not be the case. By this time, our people had, had begun to split into factions. There were now two Tuscarora groups, sometimes having brothers, sisters, and others close kin in different groups. These splits were due in part to differences of opinion on how to accomplish our goals but usually more so due to outside influences, which many times had their own agendas. Within months of the major decision, six leading representatives from the BIA came to Robinson County to begin following through with the lawsuit, but this too was sabotaged by BIA representatives by interpreting what rights were still available to our people. The BIA immediately took steps to ensure that, on, that only the A surviving 22 would benefit from these rights and took other steps to ensure that these rights stayed within the individual level and not a tribal level. We believe that this was, has always been the objective of the, of the BIA due to the fact that individuals cannot assert land rights nor treaty rights, the latter resting with only fully recognized nations. The government had no qualms about giving the surviving eight people houses or other individual rights but they continued to deny and make excuses as to why our people couldn't complete the final step of the recognition process. Subsequent appeals, petitions, and constitution proposals were sent, but then all of a sudden in 1978, with the passage of the current BIA recognition procedures, our people, including the surviving 22, were now told that they must start over from scratch, this time using new requirements. <clears throat> the first group to file a petition was the Hatteras Tuscarora in 1980. They were the 15th group to submit their petition from all over the country, and to this day, it is the oldest petition on file that has not been acted upon by the BIA. By the early 1980s, discontent continued to grow among our people, and this discontent caused individuals to break away once again and create new groups, many of which are still in existence today. The factionalism has occurred. Our people our, our people, excuse me, though factionalism has occurred, our people have constantly reunited with each other to fight for our rights. One of these united 
reunited groups in Tuscarora Tribe, North Carolina, wrote a letter in 1987 to Ross Swimmer, then Assistant Secretary of the BIA, asking the BIA for services under Lawrence Manor with the Court of Appeals case as their basis. They too were directed to file a petition, which once again basically negated the rights given 40 years prior. Nevertheless, the tribe began work on the petition, and the tribe was continually in contact with the BIA during this time. And in the early part of 1989, they informed the BIA that the petition would be filed in the coming December. In October and November of 1989, the BIA preempted Mr. Manor and the tribe's petition submission with a new solicitor's opinion. This opinion stated that the BIA would not and could not process any petition from any Indian group in Robinson and surrounding counties due to their own interpretation of the Lumbee Act. This not only included those who accepted the name Lumbee, but also the Waccamaw of Columbus County, the Cherokees of Hope and Robinson counties, as well as all petitioning such border groups. This single opinion made move the Hatter's petition that was submitted nine years prior, and also made move the petitions with, that was about to be submitted by Mr. Maynard and the TTNC, which they did submit in December. Hundreds of thousands of dollars of U.S. taxpayer monies have been wasted over the several decades by all Indians of Robinson County. Money given to agencies such as AMA for the purpose of writing petitions to the BIA has done nothing more to, than to placate and appease the various groups receiving these grants, keeping them busy, so to speak. After the money is all gone, all, and the petitions are finished and submitted, nothing is acted upon by the BIA with them using the Lumbee Act as their excuse not to carry it any further. I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, since the 1920s, our people have attempted to revive the, culture, the cultural aspects of Tuscarora culture. Beginning with the longhouse within, within the Brooks settlement, our people began to restrengthen ancestral ties with our relatives to the north. Since then, we have continued to have sporadic dealings with the Six Nations, yet today many Tuscarora groups have constantly interaction. We are reviving our language, learning our ceremonies, and reestablishing our clan system. This, to many of our people of today, now takes precedence over the fight for recognition from the U.S. that our people have sought for so long. In the last four decades, decades since the first Tuscarora group was established, Tuscarora people have endured many things. Our people have endured, discrimi endured discrimination from not only the state and federal governments, but also from our own community and kin. Lumbee leaders, past and present, have on countless occasions called the Tuscarora people factions and splinter groups of the Lumbee. We must ask, how is it that we are deemed a faction of the Lumbee tribe when the name Lumbee as a tribe is only 50 years old and the Skorure as a tribe is thousands of years old? It is a tragedy that Lumbee leaders choose to continue to perpetuate the revisionist practices that were perfected by the government long ago, but they are not the only ones to do so. Local media refuses to print stories that may contradict the history that has been accepted for so long. The local school system refuses to change their curriculum to include Tuscarora culture and history, and even this university has been guilty of the same offense. Regardless of the seemingly insurmountable odds, we as Tuscarora will survive and continue to grow. We will continue to enlighten our people, regardless of name, as to the truth of our history as we see it. And eventually, the truth will prevail. Now, Folks, we have 10 minutes before our next panel begins. If you would like to grab some refreshments, please do. But if Mr. Hardison and Mr. Hurt are willing to field 10 minutes worth of questions, well, folks, I'm watching. If that's all right with you, we can go ahead and do a little bit of Q&A. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand, and Dr. Jacobs will bring you the microphone. I just want to make a comment um, about this whole issue of the name Lumbee. And as Mr. Hardison very efficiently outlined the, the change of names and entrance of the area, I think it's important to point out, even going back to Coatan, that Coatan Indians of Robinson County and Cherokee Indians of Robinson County were names that always 
rights were imposed from the outside. That's why we were so quickly to oppose them. We didn't like protocol because it became uh, very divisive and um, it was based on the colonial spirit. Uh, we didn't like anything in Robinson County because it was too general and didn't mean anything. We didn't like Cherokee anything in Robinson County because we didn't feel the Cherokee. So all three of those were externally imposed names on our people. And it wasn't until the name Monday came out that the name was chosen by the religious leaders in our community to be the brotherhood. So it was an opportunity for us as a group of Indian people to name ourselves. And that's very traditional in my opinion people in the 20th century. There are other tribes who have taken on their traditional names. The Winnebago, the Catholic. So I think we were just 50, 100 years late to do it in the process. So I don't find the money name artificial or superficial. I think it has its name rooted in the name of the river, and it's the name we as a people have chosen to claim. That doesn't mean that any exclusion of physical presence, I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying that this, this dismissal of the Columbia name Personally, yeah, I don't understand. I don't understand. First of all, you know, less than less than two years ago, I was probably the proudest lumpy you've ever met in your life. Ask some of these tough sports over here, they'll tell you. They used to hate my guts. So, I mean, I understand. You know, that you know, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people felt, you know, they, or they felt like, well, I, I, don't, I, I don't feel like I'm Cherokee. I know I'm not Cherokee, or I know I'm not pro -tan. I really don't even know if I'm Sherrard or whatever they're saying, so this name feels comfortable to me because I can take it, I can take this name without usurping someone's identity or stealing an identity or giving an identity to myself that I know isn't, that isn't false. So, for people who, can, who can't really document or establish where that connection or the primary connection goes to, I mean, it's, it's, an, it, it, it's an appropriate name. And for that time, for the people, it was, I feel it was somewhat appropriate for them at that time to give them some way to see themselves. But then this this is the understanding that I reached. You know, that's how that's how I used to feel. The understanding that I reached in my mind is that you know I believe uh, you know I'm plus four. In my mind, I'm plus four. And if if I say I'm Lumbee. Primarily descended of Tuscaloosa, or probably mostly to a Tuscaloosa, to me, or to other people who hear me say that, it doesn't come off as though I really believe I'm Tuscaloosa. I'm saying I'm Lumbee, but mostly Tuscaloosa. I'm saying I, I'm Lumbee, but I, th I think I might be, I might be Tuscaloosa. You know what I mean? I am Tuscaloosa. Might not be. That's what my ancestors said they were. That's where they came from. So, you go, you go ahead. Could, could, I, could I make one, one thing that one comment? Dr. Robinson, I, I understand what you're saying because you you have the same feelings that many in this audience and throughout the community have also. But, you know, when, when I talk about re re the revisionist attitude, like just for the name on me, I, I, the, the, as, pertaining to the river itself. But you know, the earliest I've ever seen anything regarding about the Lumbee, the Lumbee River, was done by John Charles McGill, a, a poet laureate, um, who wrote a poem in the 1800s. And he, he referred to the, the, the Lumber River at that time, which was originally Drowning Creek, as the Lumbee. The next time that there was any mention of it was, was made by Hamilton McMillan. Uh, I would, if, if, if it's there, I would love to see proof that 
there was a, an historical river named Lumpy. But, you know, our, our, and we, we do this not to inf infuriate or demean or degrade anyone who chooses that name. We just want people to start seeing things and thinking of, about things differently. Like, like Mr. 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 Keith, Keith spoke of. You know, we, we may very well have numerous tribal bloods in this here. But as far as we're concerned, that core group, that nuclear body, has always been in touch for all. We may have Sheral, which you know, I, I've never seen proof, or actual proof, that we do. We may have Sipon. We may have Katal. We may have all these other tribes that D.F. Flowers spoke of years ago. But that still does not take away the fact that the most proper name we feel for all the people here, regardless of whether you were some of the first people that came into the area, or, or some of the Smilings or Epps that came in in the early, not the early 20th century, regardless of what you were before, like Mr. Keith says, it's the traditional way not to continue what calling what yourself, calling you yourself what you were before. Not to forget what that, what that is, but the national identity. Because that national identity to us and to the federal government is always important. Because they have always used against us that we, we cannot trace from a historical tribe. But, but we must ask, why is it D.F. Lowry was Henry Barry Lowry's nephew? Everything ever written about Henry Barry said he was a Tuscarora. Yet, and even Mr. Lowry in the 1950s and, and before stated that our people had Tuscarora blood. But why is it today that, in the, like in the Lumpy Petition, and like, like I said, local media, the curriculum in this school and all the other schools in the area, they, they seem to minimize and, and, and kind of brush off the importance of the Tuscarora connection to our people. And that does no service to anybody but the federal government and the state government. That's what they want our people to, to do, is forget about our past. Okay. I got a two-part question uh, for you and Bobby, and I may mean, let you to answer one part and Bobby answer the other part. Um, we as Tuscarora people, we have been petitioning uh, in the Senate and Congress to be allowed a voice in the Senate hearings and in the congressional hearings because these things do affect Tuscarora people, all decisions made regarding uh, the action in Congress. And why do you think and why does Bobby think that so many people like Arlene Locklear um, like many of the political leaders, and like as Dr. Ross Dunn stated, church leaders, Christian leaders, people who are responsible in a Christian manner, have worked so hard to keep us as Tuscaroras quiet on the Senate level, quiet on the congressional level, and we have had to work with our being you know, shown the brothers and sisters, particularly the Anandali Indian Nation in New York, to try to get a voice. Why do you think that it is? A, if what we're saying is all hypotheticals, and what we're saying is, is not factual. And, and we are willing to share all of our information that we have with the BIA, and the one want to keep a closed record on their so-called history. Well, you know, many of us feel that the only reason that that has occurred, and, you know, as, as late as 1991, such words were allowed brief entrance in, into these Lumbee hearings. Um, but I mean, the, the, it seems pretty reasonable to assume that the only reason that we're not allowed and, and is because of we're teaching and that we're promoting history, identity that is totally contradictory and and undoes every and undoes everything that has been associated and thought about the people, especially for the last say 50 years. You know, it, um, it, it, is, it is a shame that that's not, that we're not allowed the same form, but t today, I hope today is a new beginning. We want to thank the, the UNCP staff for allowing us to come in and, and have our say. Um, but, but Tim, you know, that's, people, people that you're referring to will really have to answer those questions. 
because he's like me.